Hey, it's Joe, and this is the ninth installment in the Quant Trading and Futures video series. Today, we'll be discussing execution. To begin, what is execution? Execution is the order entry strategy aiming to get orders filled at the best price. It is all about the minimization of trading costs because costs are certain or returns are not. So any time spent on improving the execution algorithm is going to have a certain effect on the bottom line, but time spent on improving the expected return of the strategies will not necessarily have an improvement on the bottom line because returns are very Execution is especially important for short-term trading strategies. The high-frequency trading industry in particular is all about achieving superior execution. And it's important that the execution algorithm validates the backtest slippage assumption. So most of the time we're assuming one tick of slippage in our backtests. We have to have an execution algorithm that gets no worse than one tick of slippage, or else our entire backtest would be invalidated. And what exactly is this slippage we've been discussing? Slippage is the difference between the current price and the price we get filled at. It's often denoted in ticks, where one tick is the minimum price fluctuation for a given market. And as we've discussed earlier, for a reasonably liquid market, one tick of slippage is usually a fair assumption. Slippage comes from crossing the bid-ask spread, which is the difference between the best bid and the best ask. The best bid is the highest price another trader is willing to pay to buy, and the best ask is the lowest price another trader is willing to accept to sell. And we'll have a visual later on depicting the order book with the best bid, the best ask, and the bid-ask spread. Another term we've discussed throughout the video series is liquidity. Liquidity is the ease of entering and exiting a trade without affecting the market price. Highly liquid markets are characterized by very narrow bid-ask spreads. That means if you trade these markets, you can expect to have smaller slippage than if you're trading a less liquid market. And highly liquid markets tend to have high average daily volume. That means there's always trades going on, and if you need to get in or get out of a trade, you're never going to have an issue doing so. Now, there's only about 30 to 40 futures markets that are liquid enough for one tick of slippage. So if you're trading outside of these 30 to 40 futures markets, you're going to need to increase your slippage assumption accordingly for your backtest. And finally, there is greater liquidity at certain times of day. So if you're trading at the open, at the close, or at the settlement time, you can expect there to be more liquidity and hence less slippage. So if possible, you're going to want to be trading at these times. Now onto order types. There are two fundamental order types out there, the market order and the limit order, and all other order types are combinations of these two order types. First, the market order. This is an order to buy or sell immediately. The market order is prioritizing time and it's sacrificing out on price if necessary. The limit order, on the other hand, is in order to buy or sell at no worse than the specified limit price. So the market order is prioritizing time, the limit order is prioritizing price, and it will sacrifice out on time if necessary. In practice, we almost never use market orders because they incur greater slippage. Because they're prioritizing time and they're looking to buy or sell immediately, they'll cross a bid-ask spread and this will lead to higher slippage. So we just stick with limit orders. And now we'll have a discussion of some basic market microstructure, specifically how the queue works. So suppose there are 100 buy orders at the best bid, and then some trader comes in and sends a market order to sell 10. Who among those 100 are going to get the fill? Now this varies by exchange, but it's ultimately determined by time and size. Time exchanges will give priority to orders that were submitted the earliest, and size exchanges will give priority to orders showing the largest size. So a time exchange is typically a first-in, first-out method, and for a size exchange, it's typically pro rata based on the size you're showing. So if you're quoting twice the size, you'll end up with twice the fill allocation. So we have an incentive to quote early and to quote large size, but this can be dangerous. Quoting early puts you at risk of getting picked off. So the longer your quotes are sitting out there, the greater the chance there'll be an adverse move in the market, and you'll get filled, but it'll end up being at a bad price. Quoting large size, on the other hand, can cause the price to move adversely before you even entered the market. So if I go in and I drop a huge buy order on the bid, it's going to scare away all the sellers and the price is going to jump before I get filled. All right, so now we've finished laying the foundation for execution and we can begin discussing the specific execution process. So step one is computing the trades. We compute which parameter sets are firing, we compute the number of contracts for each parameter set, and we group them by market. This is all review, of course, we discussed this in detail in the last video on risk management and position sizing. 
Ideally, there will be some internal crossing of trades. That's when strategy A gives a buy signal, strategy B gives a sell signal, so we end up trading zero contracts and saving out on the transaction costs. This is a big benefit of trading negatively correlated strategies. The biggest benefit from this is diversification, but it's also a pretty big benefit that we end up getting conflicting signals many times, so we end up trading with ourselves, there's this internal crossing of trades, and we save out on the transaction costs. Now after we've computed the trades, the trades are shown on my screen, and I have five minutes to veto them before they're sent to the execution function. So this is a technology precaution. You don't need to do this, but it would be risky if you go directly from computing the trades to sending them and having them physically trade. Because if there's some sort of error or some sort of mistake at all, you won't know until it's too late. So my strategy isn't super dependent on the execution time. Five minute window is fine. So I put in that five minute delay. I have time to review things, make sure everything is making sense. And if need be, I can veto the trades and manually override the system. Now, in practice, this never happens. It is more of a sanity check, but it is a useful one. But provided there's no issues, the trades are sent to the execution function, where the goal is to execute the trades with minimal slippage. So which order type are we going to use for our execution function? We don't want to use pure market orders because we don't want to cross a bid-ask spread. We'll have a lot of slippage, more than we need to have. And we don't want to use pure limit orders because we might not get filled. What happens if we put in our limit order? then the price moves away and it never returns, and we just don't get filled. That's no good. So the solution is we use a pegged limit order. That means if we're buying, we keep a buy limit order on the best bid. And if we're selling, we keep a sell limit order on the best ask. And if the bid rises and we're buying, we'll increase our limit price to match it. If the ask falls, conversely, and we're selling, we'll decrease our limit price to match it. And I have an illustration here to help you to understand how this algorithm works. So if you look all the way to the left, we have an order book. This has all the prices, all the bids, and all the asks. You can see that the best bid right now is at 10.04, the highest bid, and the best ask is at 10.05, the lowest ask. In this case, the bid ask spread is just one tick. So very liquid market here in this example. The highlighted price is the last traded price, and the highlighted bid is our bid. So in this example, we're trying to buy we went ahead and put in our limit order to buy at 10.04, at the best bid. Now if you look at the second order book, you can see that the price has risen. The last traded price rose to 10.06, and the best bid rose to 10.05. So in the third order book, we've gone ahead and increased our limit price to 10.05, so that we join the best bid once again. And finally, in the fourth order book, we see that the price trades down, the last traded price has fallen back down to 10.05, and we've gotten a fill. And this is really how we'd like the pegged order execution algorithm to work. We're constantly staying on the best bid and we're waiting for the market to come to us rather than crossing the spread and chasing after the market. But our execution algorithm doesn't only consist of pegged limit orders. There is more to it than that. So let's introduce one more order type, the iceberg order. The idea of the iceberg order is that we don't necessarily want to show all our size at once. We don't want to show all the cards in our hand. For example, if we're trying to buy 10 contracts, but the bid size is only one, we don't want to immediately show all 10 on the bid because it could cause the price to jump. The sellers will see the large bid and they'll remove their asks and the price will rise before we get filled. That's the last thing we want from an execution algorithm. So how the iceberg order works is you show only a fraction of the size you want to trade. Once that fraction is filled, you show more. You continue this process until everything is filled. Now the downside of an iceberg order is that every time you resubmit your order, you get placed at the end of the queue. So ideally, you'd submit your entire order size right at the beginning to establish your place in the queue. But again, you don't want to do this if you're going to cause the price to move. So let's look at the example now where the bid size, instead of being 1, bid size is 100. In this case, we'll go ahead and show all 10 on the bid because it's not really going to move the price, but we will establish our place in the queue. And we use a rule of only showing up to 10% of the bid size or ask size so often our orders are effectively iceberg orders. Not always, but in the case where the bid size is 100, we're trying to trade 10, we will show the whole size, so it's not an iceberg order. But if the bid size is less than 100, then it is going to be an iceberg order. We're going to show less than 10, and once that's filled, we'll put in the order for the remainder. So putting it all together, we have pegged iceberg orders. These are limit orders pegged to the best bid when buying and the best ask when selling showing only up to 10% of the bid size or ask size in the spirit of an iceberg order. 
We use peg limit orders so we never cross the spread while still ensuring a timely fill. And we use iceberg orders so we never move the price. And finally, it's important that the execution algorithm run very fast. If the best bid rises, we want to adjust our bid to the best bid as soon as possible so that we can establish our place in the queue. So because we want the execution algorithm to run so fast, it's coded in C++, a very fast programming language. So that'll do it for execution. Next time we're going to discuss some of the technology we use to trade.